Greetings, cherished listeners of the Asset Horizon podcast. It's Craig, your host. And if you are tuning in during May 2024, this episode's intro brings you both timely updates for this month and some of the usual timeless tidbits as well. In fact, you might hear this same intro on two May episodes because, well, you know, we try to be anti-work sometimes around here. But anyway, on Thursday, May 30th, join Asset Horizon's current crew, Will, Adam, myself, and Noah, who appears on the show from time to time, at Pete's Candy Store in Brooklyn, New York, at 7 p.m. We are hosting a live event centered around Anti-Oculus, a philosophy of escape out on repeater books. And you can expect a blend of reflection and some forward thinking regarding our work. And it is, of course, just a great excuse to hang out with friends and comrades. So consider this your official invitation, but keep in mind that space is limited. So plan ahead. Details about the event will be in the show notes. Just follow the links wherever you're tuning in from. Now, on to more heartfelt matters. As May 2024 marks the four-year anniversary of Asset Horizon, we want to extend our deepest gratitude to the ever-expanding network of interesting and compassionate friends and comrades we've met along this journey. Your support means the world to us. If you're interested in joining our reading groups or staying updated on all things within our community, consider subscribing to our Patreon. While paid supporters gain immediate access to our reading groups, know that we're here for you even in tough times. Just shoot us a DM and we'll ensure that you're included in our shared learning spaces. And if you're feeling particularly generous or find yourself somehow spontaneously brimming over with surplus cash, consider supporting us at the $5, the $10, or the $25 level. Your contributions not only help us thrive, but also spare you from those obnoxious ads that infiltrate other podcast feeds. Regardless of how you choose to support us, know that we are immensely grateful for any and all contribution to our collective. Now, let's dive into the conversation. Welcome back to Asset Horizon on Zero Books and Repeater Media. Today, we approach a text that was written for those defeated by history and by the present in the midst of a moment in which the challenge to survive such historical pressures has been redoubled. Today, we are joined by Federico Campagna, a member of the Zero Books alumni and the author of The Last Night, Anti-Work, Atheism, Adventure. He is a lecturer in intellectual history at ECAL in Lausanne and associate fellow at the Warburg Institute in London and a critical fellow at the Royal Academy Schools in London. He also works as a rights director at Verso Books, and he is a senior editor at the Italian philosophy publisher, Timio, which he co-founded. Federico, in the book that we're about to discuss today, has put forward the question, how is what we call reality in all of its facets cosmologically constituted? In other words, what are the basic metaphysical assumptions infused within the armature of the grander apparatus of the current age? Moreover, in a world that construes all life as a standing reserve, potential labor, or known quantities of any sort, what alternative paradigm affords us a path to escaping, resisting, and transforming the world we live in? On today's show, we pick up Federico's Technic and Magic from 2018 to discuss life in the age of Technic and the concept of magic as its countervailing force. Federico, thank you for responding to our invite. It's great to have you with us. Hello. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. And um, it's especially a pleasure, I have to say, because the book that you mentioned, the old book that I wrote the last night, um, in a way was the beginning of this other book, Technic and Magic, that you mentioned later. And so I'm, I'm particularly happy to be back at Zero Repeater. Oh, great. Well, is there anything that you want to say about yourself, something that you're working on now or, you know, other things that you might be involved with to, to help us to get to know you a little bit better? Well, I'm working now on a new book on the Mediterranean imagination, uh, which should come out, God willing, next year. So everything goes well. But the only thing I wanted to say is going back to the old book, uh, also to give a sense of where the, the whole thing came from. In 2012, 13, Mark Fisher commissioned that book to me. And 
that really kind of, first of all, gave me the confidence to then write all the rest. And it really changed my life being commissioned a book by Mark. But also Mark's thought on the importance of the imagination and the, the way of changing our imaginary as a fundamental pre-political act. I think that gives the general frame of where I've been ever since. So really, I can find there the, the beginning of everything else for me. Well, that sounds a lot like what we do on Acid Horizon and, and my research in particular, which in our book, Antioculus, investigates the urgency with which we need to recover research of the imagination and the imagination as we understand it as this pre-political entity. And I mean, certainly that's what's happening in this book. And I actually, one of the ways that I came to this book was uh, from a podcast called Weird Studies, which is quite popular here in North America. And in some ways, Technic and Magic is one of the big monuments within the within this parrot academic world. And, you know, after having heard about it so much, I was impelled to go read it myself and, you know, was pleased to discover that many of the themes that you cover in this book overlap with some of the research area in our, in our own collective work with Asset Horizon. So I, I think the first question that I would have for you is, one of the reasons that this book might be particularly challenging to folks that you say are defeated by history and by the present is that its entry point into understanding the nature of what we call technic does not lead off with an analysis of socioeconomic factors, but it instead begins with this question of how the world, in fact, derives from certain metaphysical axioms, which you say combine to form a reality system within which we live. Can you just give us a general overview of that theory? that conceit and and what explain what led to that methodological choice well the idea is that it's quite straightforward really we can understand the way in which we administer and imagine social institutions in a way that is fairly similar to a game as in we define at the beginning the realm of what is possible what is impossible then we define what kind of pieces are on the game board and what are the possibilities of each one, then on that basis, we then produce a theory, a strategy of how best to administer the movements of the pieces and the resources available. Now, the problem is that the definition of the game board and the definition of the pieces there and the definition of the possibilities is not an objective decision. We, if we look at throughout history, we see that different human communities and still today, different human communities have imagined the game board of the world very differently and the kind of entities that inhabit it, for example, the presence or not of a god or of souls or of molecules or of an ecosystem and so on and so forth. You know, the items that populate this game have changed because we as human beings are given to live and exist within reality not with the direct access to the objective truth. We are somehow shielded from that because of the limitedness of our cognitive means, which remains limited however much we want to expand them technologically. So we, we always live by hypothesis, by fictional hypothesis. This is the pre-political level. Depending on how we structure our world at this level of the hypothesis of what constitutes our reality, what is part of it, what it isn't. On that basis, then we can imagine politics. We can imagine administration and so on. I got into this, into examining this pre-political level, so this level of the fundamental imagination, because I realized that in the political debate that we were having at the time when I wrote the book, which is not that long ago, but six years ago, and still today and in any moment, the realm of the possible was predefined, was predefined at that fundamental level of the imagination, which is not part of the political debate because it comes before. So I thought in order to change the political debate we might have in this condition, which seems very stuck with limited possibilities, to go back to the beginning and revisit what are the fundamental pieces that populate our game board and what are the fundamental possibilities. This book is so unusual uh, in terms of it being what I believe is a political book. And it's structured on the basis of these two sort of competing systems of neoplatonist emanationism. And for those of us who need to brush up on our old neoplatonist metaphysics, 
I would like to discuss some of the terms and concepts that you use in, in the book more closely. You say that the basic structure of the system presents to us this pair of what I would call emanationist ladders. So on the one side, you have this system of technic, and you have another system of magic. And each feature or each series has its own series of hypostases, which are comprised of broader or more constrained abstractions, which circumscribe various aspects or dimensions of life. And so I want to unpack these concepts a bit, but I was hoping that you could do so perhaps in the context of how these ideas might cash out politically. And maybe we can do that first by explaining the ladder of technic, which I, I believe carries various implications regarding, for example, how we might commonly call what we commonly call the nature or the environment. How does that fall into a paradigm of use? And how do things like trees, rivers, and minerals get marked off in ways that make them valuable for a system of profit? And then how does all of that factor back into the game board that you're talking about? Well, that's a very big question because it requires some explanation, I think, of some terms. For example, Neoplatonism, maybe not everybody is um, familiar with the term. Neoplatonism is a current of thought in philosophy developed from the third century AD, starting with an Egyptian uh, philosopher called Plotinus, Egyptian writing in Greece, in Greek, but living in Rome, typical of the, the Mediterranean spirit of the time. And so this North African philosopher developed this new, we, we say Neoplatonist, this new understanding of Plato's philosophy, which he claimed was in fact the real understanding of Plato's philosophy. And that might really be the case because Plato's philosophy is only partly written partly unwritten, and so maybe he was tapping into the unwritten part of Plato's philosophy. According to this Neoplatonist view, we can see the world as a series of dimensions, and I personally subscribe to this vision of, of reality, a series of dimensions that, in a way, are divided as such, depending on our ability to access them. So we have different layers of access to reality. The final layer, so to say, so if we had access to the essence of reality, to the totality of it, the essence and the totality in this case are the same. What he calls the one is entirely ineffable, is entirely beyond our understanding. Between us and it, between our awareness and this ineffable chaos, mystery one of reality, there are multiple layers that in a way create bridges and produce reality for us on the basis of the principles of the rhythm instilled by the one. Okay, after this very short introduction to Neoplatonism, I adopted this system, uh, the Neoplatonist system, for two reasons. Uh, the first is that I personally subscribe to the Neoplatonist vision of reality. So the magic part, the propositive, the positive part of the book follows a, a Neoplatonist approach in metaphysics, but also because it is beautiful and, you know, uh, having a sort of like aesthetics in, in thought is, I think, is very important. Not only beautiful, but it's also clear. It allows you to outline in a very neat way the different constitutive parts of a system of thought, of a metaphysical system of thought, of a construction of reality. So that's why I used it. Now, what I did is that I identified within our way of seeing reality today, I identified the first principle, similar to the one for Plotinus, but the opposite. The first principle of an idea of reality that is entirely opposite to a Neoplatonist view, that sees the fundamental rhythm, the, the technique, the principle that creates our perception of the world as language absolute language. So the concept at the basis of this is that what exists within reality coincides with what can be captured by language, any form of language. Could be mathematical, could be scientific, could be descriptive, uh, the language of citizenship, and so on and so forth. You know, these are different linguistic forms. And then that what does not fall into language, what escapes or resists capture by language does not exist even though it might be there, it still does not exist. Things exist to the extent to which they submit to be captured by language, by linguistic series. This is the fundamental principle of technique. Now, in the book, and, you know, we will need a lot more time to go into the, the details of it, 
in the book, I look ha- at how this fundamental hypothesis about how reality is built in a fundamental hypothesis, which is legitimate. I'm not saying it's not legitimate, but it creates a particular conformation of the world. It creates a particular game where certain things are possible, certain things are impossible. Certain entities exist, certain entities do not exist. For example, in this form of reality, individuals that resist falling clearly within an identity, a linguistically clear identity, they resist that, they escape it, exist less for that. Undocumented migrants mm -hmm, that fall out of of a number of linguistic series because of that, falling out and not being captured, exist less to the point that things can go extinct, can also not be recognized as existing at all before they die. So they might be there and not there at the same time. Now, this is a legitimate choice in terms of metaphysics. Every, Every hypothesis is legitimate, but it creates a particular world which, you know, has costs and consequences. And I oppose to this system magic precisely to offer an alternative hypothesis on how we can restructure our idea of reality that creates different possibilities, an entirely different set of possibilities. Yes, I I think it's fascinating, um, even though it kind of cuts directly against the grain of many of my Deleuzian commitments, but in some ways is evocative of them simultaneously. So I'm in tension as I'm reading this entire book. One of the parts of the theory of technic that I'd like to interrogate a little bit before I pass it over to Will is where you talk about the fifth hypostasis, life is vulnerability. And so basically at the top of this emanationist chain, you have what you called absolute language, which is emanating or radiating this shining light over another series of hypostases, these other categories, which are capturing life in the manner that you described. But at the very end of this chain, we have what is called life is vulnerability. And it is reached by only the faintest glimmers of Technic's radiance. And it's here where Technic reaches its limit and life encounters these burgeoning rhythms that are somehow outside of Technic's general apparatus of control. And despite the secularism of Technic, you write that it retains a number of the categories from religious traditions, namely the concept of sin or original sin as a way to capture and reinscribe forces or entities that escape Technic. And and what's most interesting to me is that it suggests that the logic of Technic itself and the primacy of something like absolute language are ultimately grounded in a notion of salvation. And that without this sort of salvific algorithm injected into Technic, things would fall apart. What this does for me is, I I mean, I think about all of the things in my research that are important for, for example, like with Nietzsche and Foucault, how the importance of debt and punishment are ways in which the very systems that we live within and are oppressed by are ultimately recuperated. I'd like you to talk about that a little bit and, and, and maybe see if there's any sort of overlap or dovetailing between those, those series of claims that I just put forward. And what do you think are the real implications of, of a salvific ideology injected within the Technic in, in the political world? Well, the, 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 the items that you were mentioning, salvation and sin, for example, they, they typically fall into the, into the religious discourse. And religion... Religion had a had a very bad name for a long time, for the last two hundred years, I would say, um, in part because religion has you know lost much of its unique characteristics. You know, has become a form of politics, uh, but also in part, I think, because of a misunderstanding of what religion really stands for. The religious attitude and the religious vocabulary come into play and they become important whenever we confront the limits of cognition, whenever we confront the limits of language, the limits of understanding, the limits of the world. Religion, similarly to certain forms of poetry, and in fact, you know, many people who reject religion usually look into poetry for a very similar function, is a liminal, is a liminal mode of understanding. Now, in the case of technique, the system of technique being a hypothesis about how the world is constructed and being a hypothesis is, of course, a limited field. And now this limited field has to confront its limitedness, even though it presents itself as unlimited, even though it presents itself as 
nature objectively, you know, by, with no limitations, clear and infinite. In fact, it's got limitations. It's, a, it's an hypothesis that gets up to a certain point, but there is something that exceeds it. At that level, at the level of the excess to a hypothesis, there is where we, we start inevitably using or finding a religious attitude, an authentically religious attitude. In the case of, of technique, what exceeds the hypothesis of technique, of this world based on absolute language, is precisely what doesn't fall into language. The fact that the things somehow resist. The reality always defies the attempt to entirely translate it within a linguistic grid. There is always something that resists. The, the, there are aporias, there are paradoxes within language. Now, Technic tries to legitimately, once again, I mean, I think the point here is what I'm not trying to disprove Technic as false. I'm trying to present it for what it is and then suggesting that the world it creates is an unlivable world, even though it's legitimate. So the way Technic responds to this is by deploying a, a, a different system. You know, the idea that these resistances, what resists the capture by language, are opportunities for growth. You know, there are problems that can be resolved. So this idea of an infinite expansion of the series of language, infinite expansion of the capture, the fact that we can potentially capture everything. We just have to improve our language, improve our machines of capture, or uh, find new words and so on and so forth, polish and police our language more, and then we will be truly able to capture things. Now, this is the, the trick used by Technic in order to go back, to go back to the beginning and to somehow deny or push aside its own limitations. Now, you see that this trick, and I used a couple of, of, of expressions here, for example, the idea of infinite growth of the machinery, okay, this is a typical, let's say, simply right-wing, control-driven, um, profit-driven vocabulary, but at the same time, the idea of policing language, and that's they identified more as a left-wing in the contemporary term, attitude, because technic does not have a specific political color. Technic is a system of creation of the world that allows for political formations and political strategies that can self-identify either as left-wing or as right-wing, but they share something very important together. Not this subservience to language, this state of minority towards semantics, and this, this decision to completely um, forget the ineffable dimension and quality of reality. This is shared by all of them. Now, this intuition you can find, for example, also in the work of um, Emanuele Severino, who was an Italian philosopher. He died not long ago, and he also identified technique as that thing, writing in the 1980s, that thing that both the USSR and the US had in common. And he said, he was noticing at the time that despite the great differences between the two systems, which are undeniable, of course, but they still had something in terms of their fundamental view, worldview in common. Talking about salvation, um, I would prefer to use the word redemption rather than salvation. Salvation implies the fact that there is a problem that you can fix, okay? You are uh, about to get lost or to be de destroyed, but then you are saved. So you are reconstituted, you are reinstituted back into your, the place where you were before, okay? The problem is fixed. There is this problem-solving attitude to the notion of salvation. Redemption is different. Redemption is the notion that there, is, there are problems that cannot be fixed. There are paradoxes that cannot be overcome. And there are tragedies that cannot be avoided, but they can be redeemed. Redemption is the idea that we do not always have an attitude towards certain features of reality that are above and beyond our understanding or our means of trying to capture them, but we recognize our limitedness towards them. At the same time, we recognize that we must live a dignified life, and these limits sometimes hamper that. And so we find a solution to coexist with our limits. That is redemption. It's similar to 
catharsis in, um, in, in a Greek tragedy. There's something similar to that. Not, uh, it's not a coincidence, of course, that the notion of redemption as part of Christianity comes from a tradition, which is Christianity, that is eminently Greek um, in the language and in the thought. You use a lot of Heidegger's terminology after the turn. A lot of what's coming out of the question concerning technology, which you cite explicitly, and also in the age of the world picture. So just for clarity's sake, what's the relationship between technic and revealing, essencing, truthing? Or what is it about technology that changes a given metaphysical epoch? Why is this the this a specific zone of interrogation for you as opposed to you know any other given metaphysical mode of revealing the world to us or constructing as you say reality well as as you pointed out i chose the term technique to refer not to technology but to what can be found in part as the essence of technology today Technology in itself is something much broader than technology today. Everything is technology, including language, including writing, including everything, including my own name. Okay, so um, technology is a very broad field. Technic is, a, according to Heidegger, is a particular way in which reality manifests itself through a certain frame. I took some aspect of Heidegger's thought, but to be honest, actually, most of it I took from Ernest Jünger not from Heidegger. Ernest Jünger was, I find, a great writer of the early and mid and late 20th century. He had a very long life. And Heidegger took many ideas from, from Jünger and re-elaborated them. What's peculiar about the way in which the reality manifests itself through technique, so through the, the, the lens of absolute language, so through a, a, a way of making world that is rooted in the first principle of absolute language, is that it produces an emotion in the people that use this tool, it produces an illusion. The illusion that reality and the world coincide. The world is what is created by us through our cognitive, conceptual, technological means and linguistic means primarily. The world is what is constructed through language fundamentally. Reality is existence in itself. Technic gives rise to a, an experience of reality where the person is invited to consider the world and the reality coincide. Now, I think this is, you know, once again, it's legitimate on an existential level, but it's very um, ambitious and um, ungrounded. You know, it's... Uh, it's a very dangerous move to, to think that everything that we can capture coincides with everything that exists and anything that we cannot, through our linguistic means, capture does not exist. This leads to a series of dangerous consequences. So that's the specificity of technique in the way in which it reveals reality. It is, what I'm contesting there is not its limitedness, you know, it is an hypothesis and it, is, it gives rise to a fiction, but it produces a certain way of relating also to the world. Anything that within the world is partly out is not recognized as fully there or is denied or is discriminated against. Does this answer your, your, your question? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's the fundamental mode of sort of disclosure, right? And th this is in Ernst Jünger's The Worker, which is a text that's actually hard to get nowadays unless you want to fund like a right-wing paramilitary group that's publishing in the United States. Like, don't buy it from Arctos Press. <laughs> like, I guess that would just be like my one warning. Like, yes, the Carl Schmidt books and all that, Klages, uh, Jünger, they're all very cheap there, but there's a reason. Telos Press, no? Publishes it in the US. Yeah, also, also Telos Press. I, I would try to get an academic edition if you could. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's a mode of, of, of disclosure, but... When you say there's a relationship between sort of reality and existence, 
And then there is the world, right? The worlding of the world. Can you sort of break down the relationship between where reality sits in relation to these two historical modes that you're sort of positioning yourself between uh, in your analysis? You know, where, where does reality hang between technic and magic? Well, reality is the, um, the condition of possibility for all the worlds. Reality, you can call it in many ways. You can call reality as existence in itself, the totality of all that is, being with a capital B, uh, the At- Atman and the Brahman, God. You know, there's many ways in which we can call reality. The, the infinite universe in its in in the microscopic and macroscopic infinity, and so on and so forth. Everything that is in itself, the thing itself, that is reality. The thing itself, or many other ways in which we have, I've tried to call it, is the condition of possibility for the hypothesis that we call worlds, that I, tr- that I suggest to define as worlds. The worlds are ways in which an awareness the awareness of a human being, but also the awareness of an ant or of a tree or, or whoever, you know, it relates with a certain degree of form of awareness to reality and has to navigate it. We need, because of our limitedness, to create simplified fields that are within our grasp and where we can project some form of activity and meaning a tree, a whale, a fungus, an ant, a human, or wh- whatever other species exists in the universe, do this differently. And within each species, different cultures embrace different ways of doing this. And within each, each, each culture, different moments have different variants, and each individual has a different way of making world. These all these things sit on the very possibility offered by reality. Now, the question probably also is, which one of these is the most correct? Which world gets the closest to reality itself? The answer, I think, is none of them and all of them at the same time. Reality contains within itself all the possible worlds, simultaneously and always already. Everything already always exists within reality, which is the very condition of existence, is the very fact of existence. The way in which this pure existence manifests itself, becomes actualized, depends on the perspective from which it is seen. Okay? So the the world is a way in which reality actualizes itself. Reality is pure virtuality is all the possibles or all that can ever be even beyond the human understanding of possibility, possible not only in a logical way. So all that can ever be is always and already. In in medieval um, Islamic uh, philosophy, for example, this is considered as thoughts that are always already present in the mind of God. Okay, All the possible thoughts are already being thought. But some of them, and this is in hermetism, some of them become actualized. Actualized means that they are witnessed. In order to be witnessed, it means that they are included within somebody's world. They are included within a hypothesis. The range of the actual is not particularly revealing of what reality is. The range of the infinite possible is revealing, but that includes everything. You know, there's that famous line from the Foucault lecture, subjectivity and truth. The reality is not the truth of the world to itself. There is something kind of in that process that exists as a kind of catalyst for maybe we could call it actualization or presencing. Mm. Sorry, I, I realized that I didn't answer to a part of your previous question. Um, <laughs> if you don't mind, so it just came to mind now. I think what's what I find interesting in the form of worlding uh, that I that I called magic, it could be called any other way, of course, uh, in that particular form of worlding, is that unlike technic, but also unlike many other forms of worlding, um, it is very conscious of its own fictionality. It's very conscious of its own legitimacy at an existential level. But, you know, Still, you know, the fact that it, it cannot 
hold claim to any truthfulness or any higher degree of truthfulness than any other. Its quality depends entirely on the experience it gives to the people that inhabit it, and at the same time to its own self, to the self-awareness of its own limitedness. This is the typical philosophical attitude, you know, the Socratic idea that knowing your own ignorance is the key of knowledge itself. Magic is a system of reality that is open, a system of worlding that is open to reality in the sense that it, it doesn't pretend to explain it, but tries always to keep an openness, you know, um, to remind the user, world, world systems are used, you know, they're tools. It reminds the user that they are making worlds, they are making fictions. They are not exhausting or controlling or managing reality. That's great. And then you know, one of the interests that came, you know, quietly out of the, this whole tradition of analyzing technique, whether that means technique or the broader term of technology, which can mean anything from an ethical regimen to an approach to the world, right? One of the ones that you kind of focus in on, and you start with sort of Ernst Junger, and I just want to pull up the passage. When you take up Junger's The Worker, and you talk about where Junger sits kind of in this, in this sort of region of his early thought between the worker and total mobilization. This is something that's sort of been called a productionist metaphysics, right? An idea that things kind of manifest precisely through what we can sort of sap out of them, what we can reinsert into processes of production. And you sort of you sort of call this the the spirit of absolute instrumentality, according to which everything is a means to an end, where the only ultimate end is the limitless expansion of accumulated productive ability. So you're kind of providing us with this sort of circle. And I'm wondering if part of this could be applied to the ways in which we've talked about historically like the metaphysics of the will right you know uh and the way in which we sort of leave this vitality untested right whether it's in aquinas or in uh nietzsche it doesn't really matter right and i'm wondering if this essence of machinic technology of absolute instrumentality is something that we should be we should sort of take up when we look at the entirety of the history of philosophy, not just you know the conditions of possibility for, say, like World War I or something like that. The question of the telos that is just the return back to the productive expansion, the final cause as the very process itself. Yeah, I think this, this kind of is, an, is a typical element of every system of worlding that we embrace. It applies to, to magic as much as to technique. In a way, as every hypothesis that has to be embraced uh, or that, you know, that in order to function has to be believed to a certain extent, then it has to repower itself at the end. So it encounters its final limit. And then at the moment of its final limit, in order not to completely disintegrate, has to go back to the beginning. In the case of Technic, this was the example of life as vulnerability, how technique confronts what escapes it, and it confronts it with the idea of the problem, with the idea of the infinite growth, the challenge, and so on and so forth. In the case of magic also, we have you know, a system of thought that at some point meets its limit. And also in this case, it has to go back to the beginning and repower itself. So it is shared, I think, across all systems, uh, all systems of making world. What is different in the case of magic as in the case of technique, so in the two different modalities of making world that I, that I examined, and I suggested this, the magic as the one that I suggest to, to embrace because it creates a different experience of, world, of the world. The difference there is that it encounters, encounters its limit and in encountering its limit does not deny it. In the case of technique, there is a process of denial. The point of it is that technique presents itself as a, total way of understanding, capturing, putting to work, mobilizing reality. And so in order for that to uh, repower itself, it has to deny the excess 
you see that, of course, denying the excess means in practical terms, means repressing or erasing, I don't know, however you want to call it, you know, and you can visualize, I think, immediately in your mind, a series of examples of how that happens, medicalizing it. In the case of magic, the relationship with, the, with its own excess is more relaxed, simply because at the very beginning of man magic, there is the excess. This is not an excess in the sense of uh, orgiastic excess, you know, an excess of vitality, uh, erotic excess, and so on and so forth. That kind of vitalistic 20th century vibe I've always has always left me a little bit cold, you know, that kind of um, youthful attitude. But um, it's much more senile, if you like, uh, relationship. The excess being... In the case of magic, the ineffability, the fact that whenever we encounter anything, any object, this lighter, myself, I encounter myself and this lighter to a minuscule extent. I have an inf infinitely small access to this thing. And even that small access is entirely fictional. But there is infinitely more to that object than what I can understand. In this encounter, then I go back to the very beginning. I, re I return to the, and I think we might be talking about this maybe in the next bit about the, the, the very beginning of magic. Now, the consequence of this, I think, is quite interesting. For example, in the case of technique, the encounter with mortality is seen as a problem to be resolved. You have to fix your diet to whatever, find new medicines and so on and so forth with this constant attempt at escaping mortality uh, in the, the US is, is especially strong in this, in this, um, in this regard, the, the debate, the culture, you escape it either with an illusion of solution or by denying it entirely, medicalizing it, erasing it from the scene or by an attempt at redemption through heroic rhetorics, you know, so to the point that sometimes in newspapers, you you find that somebody who suffers an illness, a serious illness, for example, like cancer, described as a hero. Why? Because the fact of mortality, excess of mortality, cannot be included for what it is, which is arriving to a point after which we have absolutely no idea of anything. We have no understanding of what death is. Death is only a negative concept for us. That's just a fact. In magic, the encounter with mortality is entirely different. You uh, look at mortality... And you deny the very idea of mortality, as we understand it today, because you see that mortality is an attribute that applies to a fiction. Federico dies. But what is Federico? Federico is a metaphysical fiction, not just my name and my identity, but also the particular fiction that encompasses my biological conglomerate. Is that all there is of me? No. That's all that I can understand linguistically of myself. But can I truly say that I am that? No, I cannot. So if that dies, does that mean the end of me? No, it means the end of that fiction. You see, the relationship with mortality is very different because you suspend your judgment entirely about it. And also you embrace it as the fact that it, is, it might be a non-event. It is an event only within the world. Is it an event within reality? Probably not, because I, Federico, or yourself, or anything, I am an existent at the same time within the world and within reality. And what exists within the world is not all that exists. You know, that's fascinating. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Harlan Ellison's short story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. We actually did a discussion on this, but in short, precisely what I believe is the theme of that story. It's about folks who are essentially trapped within a machinic simulation, essentially ensconced within this utter shell of technic. And every time that they die within this, this constituted reality, they are brought back to life in this sort of perpetual uh, loop of life and death, where when they meet the limit of life, which is death, it is denied in the aspect that they are always returned back to life. And that is the hell of that particular 
hellscape in Harlan Ellison's story. But I think we should delve deeper into magic. If we don't talk about magic in this conversation, I'm going to have a lot of people who are going to be very upset with me. But something you said right at the top of our episode really pricked up my ears, which was when having a philosophy, when positing a metaphysical or a cosmological system, it was important to you for it to have a sense of beauty. And beauty for me is one of the very regions that's contested by both the system of technic and the system of magic and are understood and perhaps even circumscribed in very different ways. There's one sense, for example, in which when we think of beauty, we think of particular standards of beauty. That person is beautiful because they have symmetrical features. They have diminutive features. They, they look a particular way. They fit a certain mold, which smacks more of technic than magic. But there's probably a sense in which we could construe beauty as being that ineffable, being that thing that cannot be grasped. How does beauty sort of pan out in, in the, the competing systems of technic and magic? That's a very good question. And I, I did not examine this in the, in the book itself. So I think the, the notion of beauty goes together with the particular hypothesis that one adopts to create a particular world. So they, of course, change. In, and they reinforce or somehow or at least um, are compatible, the, the, the notion of beauty and the idea of world. In the case of technic, something is beautiful to the extent to which it is scalable, also commercially scalable, and uh, exhaustive. Something is beautiful to the extent to which it, it creates a space that occupies as much as possible the experience to the maximum extent, and then even beyond that can replicate itself infinitely. Now, you see this, for example, in pop music, I think. Um, that's a good example. The, the, the sonority, the sound of, of pop music is at the same time entirely saturated. You know, it, it completely envelops your experience without any openness or any gap. And it lends itself to be infinitely replicated. The idea of the sequel, for example, which is typical of, of contemporary films, is not a sign of the decadence of contemporary culture. It's precisely the modality of contemporary culture. That's the idea of beauty. It's not. I think this is, there is a misunderstanding. It's the perfection of it. Now, in the, in the case of magic, the idea of beauty is a bit different and depends on the fact that the, the world of magic is not... A, a, it's not an object that aims to be entirely exhaustive of your experience and of reality itself. It doesn't aim to, to occupy the entire space and does not aim to replicate itself extensionally. So with the, with the infinite reproduction. The point of the world system of magic is reflected in a notion of beauty that is similar to something is beautiful to the extent to which it is inhabitable. Something is beautiful to the, to the extent to which it is inhabitable, where we have to understand the notion of inhabiting something as a complex experience, which is emotional, which is physical, um, so bio biological, um, which is conceptual at the same time. An inhabitable space is a space that allows you to be within it many different things, to, mod to allow for transformations within allows for transformations of the space itself, so it's not excessively rigid. And also, like a house, is inhabitable if it has windows, okay? A house without windows no, is not a good place to live. So opens onto the outside, but as walls as well. You know, it is, it is a complex creation in which you have, you cater for the need of the person, to have a feeling of control, the wall, you know, to have a feeling of control that this is an enclosed space, this is my world. And at least to a certain extent, I can believe it. Because if I don't believe it, I don't, I can't inhabit it. But then at the same time, I'm reminded that it is just my world. The reality is much wider than that. That this house where I live, even if it appears to disappear, it doesn't disappear because there is, there is no nothingness. You know, there is outside of it, there is no the infinite space of how you, instead technique understands the space outside of its own systems of language, absolute nothingness. So 
the notion of beauty in magic has this aspect of in of being inhabitable as the aspect of redemption so it is capable of um consoling the tragedies that happen within its space doesn't necessarily fix them all fixes what's fixable and what's not fixable tries to redeem the windows do that is there is a function of of redemption you find something similar to this particular aesthetics in the way in which you encounter for example mythological literature mythological literature not only the the standard mythology but also mythological things like um the homeric epics or mythological uh, productions like such as fables and certain fairy tales they are all mythological formations james hillman would easily or or carl gustav jung would easily recognize them as part of the same family in those forms of literature you see that there is an openness to the proliferation of stories within the stories the idea of the character being always in transformation but also open to be inhabited and then abandoned by the reader constantly the openness to a sense beyond the sense so the style for example that you encounter in mythological writing is very rarely this the um, the saturated style of a novel you know it's very it's very dry is is very uh, minimal <laughs> um so there are some similarities in in aesthetic terms between the style of um of magic and the style of mythology but to the style of magic i dedicated a, another book which is called prophetic culture which goes into the specific aesthetics of it i would like to really dig into the consolation of magic and get ready because i'm going to ask you if you really believe in magic but also i'm going to ask about the ways in which traditional forms of arcana and their practice and reemergence in in even our time might be capable of or might be a modality through which we can realize the kind of openness that you're talking about at the beginning of the pandemic i was talking with my older brother and i might have said this on another episode but we had noticed that there was an absolute resurgence in an interest in things like witchcraft tarot and all sorts of things and of course there's you know ebbs and flows of that at any given time in any given decade but he had put forward the idea or the explanation that the reason that that was happening is that we currently live in a world that was so epistemologically compromised through things like fake news and not knowing what the future is like and and everything else besides and there's a way in which for example you know especially those of us who are involved with materialist philosophy tend to preclude some notion of irrationality but then when one attempts to engage in a kind of magical practice even if it's something sim- as simple as doing an oracle or having your tarot read or something like that it creates this kind of break with ordinary epistemology ordinary perception and if you kind of let it in it brings about a kind of scent or aroma and and it gives us a chance to experience that aesthetic beauty i mean even the etymology of the word aesthetics is aesthesis which means to breathe in there's a kind of a filling of the lungs and so my question ultimately is do you believe in magic in that sense i have to say in hindsight years after the publication of this book that the title i chose uh was um was good marketing wise but it it, it lent itself to some misunderstandings <laughs> um when i talk about magic i talk about something that maybe is more precisely defined as mysticism which is a very very different thing mysticism and magic of magic as it is understood today commonly witchcraft tarot astrology and so on and so forth is a very different idea in the contemporary idea of magic which is very harry potteresque um has is a continuation of technique through other means is a perception that um we can reproduce the mechanical capturing mode with the things that usually escape our normal world just simply by expanding our world so we were not aware there were certain invisible forces but with this new system of language called astrology or tarot or whatever we finally gain access to them and we can reduce them to a system of sense you know that but this is technique this is just technique you know this is once again the same this attitude 
towards the rediscovery of astrology, which in and of itself, I think, opens some fantastic artistic and poetic possibilities, by the way, is not new. You had it at the beginning of the 20th century, you had it in late antiquity, you had it in Hellenism. Typically, you have it in moments when people start feeling that there is something going on that is beyond their control. There is the feeling of the end of a particular world. There are forces, so to say. So there is, it is as if there was an agency beyond your own. And then you try to anthropomorphize it, to kind of like assign it to a, to a particular item, the planets or whatever, spirits, and so on and so forth. This is a normal reaction um, to that. And I think it's happening once again today. It is positive in the sense that it, um, to the extent to which it signals that we are, first of all, becoming conscious of the fact that the world that we have created no longer caters for our existential needs. Um, and, and then we have lost agency over it. Yes, it is a fiction, but it's no longer a fiction of which we are also the authors. It's a fiction in which we are only the characters, not even the characters. We, it's a fiction of which we are only the letters, the recombinable letters of the world. We don't even have the dignity of characters. Okay. And so it, it is positive to that extent that it, it signals to this. But I think the the difficulty is to really renounce to the fundamental way in which we relate with reality, what I call technique. There is a replication of that. In the case of magic, as I call it in my book, which I, uh, <laughs> as I said, I mean, maybe it was a mistake on my part to use that particular word, even though I explained in the book why I use that word, uh, from the Gike Tekne, from the Persians, and so on and so forth. But the attitude that I propose which is closer to a mystical attitude, is, is very, very different. It does not suggest that there are forces beyond the world that we can control or that we can uh, gain access to while maintaining entirely our metaphysics intact, but rather that there is something beyond our understanding, our, our range of capture, that will always remain beyond our understanding and our range of capture that to the existence of every object, there are dimensions that always exceed us, that our mind and our technological tools will always inevitably remain limited and blind to the most important, greatest, fundamental part of reality. And that we have to deal with that, not by resolving this problem, which we cannot resolve, but by coming to terms with it, by finding a way of making world that doesn't forget this. This is mysticism, fundamentally. Mysticism tries to come to terms with it by saying, screw the world, let's entirely kind of like disintegrate ourselves in the real reality, let's abandon the world. In the case of magic, which is also why I called it magic, it's not fully-fledged mysticism, because I suggest to not do that. I suggest to find a reformist, not revolutionary solution to this problem. To maintain a world, but a world that is aware of, that is aware of its limitations. If I believe in this, indeed I do. And I think every philosopher fundamentally does if they are philosophers, because this is the essence of philosophy. The essence of philosophy is not an attempt to capture reality, put it to work and so on and so forth. That's just um, that's a compulsive disorder. But philosophy is the attempt to test the limits of your understanding while contemplating what is beyond your understanding and working with your mind while never forgetting that your mind has, is a limited tool. If you forget that, you, you no longer do philosophy. You know, if you forget that you're doing something, something else and usually something very, very dangerous. So yeah, I do believe in magic in that sense. Well, we have approached the hour. I have one more question to kind of have us wrap up here. The notion of the ethics of mysticism or the ethics of the ineffable then raises the question for me, what does the practical dimension of that look like? How do we promulgate an awareness or a, an ethical commitment to the kind of mysticism that you're defining or the, the ethics of, of ineffability? And how does that chalk up in the real world? Let, let's do a little bit of divination right now. Like, what, what, what do we see 
you know, in a world 10, 20, 30 years from now, in a world that has disavowed this, this addiction to technic in the way that we've described? Well, I tend not to give per political prescriptions uh, because it's not, I, I, I don't like doing that. I, I, as an anarchist myself, I am always very skeptical about giving political prescriptions to people. But if somebody asks me what is the first thing they can do to enact magic, I think is to stop an anti-immigration raid. Let's say uh, that's the first thing that you can do. So to confront a, a police force that um, raids undocumented migrants on the basis of their failure to comply to linguistic seriousness while not recognizing that within each of them there is the infinity of reality in itself. That like Emmanuel Levina used to say that there is the face of God in their face in the sense that in every, in every existence there is, okay? And treating them like linguistic units. Okay, when you, when you witness something like that, stopping an anti-immigration raid, disrupting it, that's it. Excellent. Well, Federico, I want to thank you for responding to my initial invite. I'm going to put links to The Last Night and Technic and Magic in the show notes. And upon your completion of your newest work, we would love to have you back at some point to talk about that. Hopefully it shall be completed. So yeah, <laughs> that would be a pleasure. <laughs>